Hello, you beautiful degenerates, and welcome to Links and Locks, the Action Network's golf betting podcast presented by Bet365. Alongside Spencer Aguiar, Nick Bretwish, I'm Roberto Arquello. Thanks for joining our show today. We are breaking down our Texas Children's Houston Open betting preview this week. The PGA Tour previously in this week after the Florida Swing swung to Texas, Austin, for the WGC Dell Technologies match play, but that event is not on the calendar this year. So instead, they moved the Houston Open from the fall swing up ahead to the spring. So we're going to have a new spot on the schedule this week for the Texas Children's Houston Open. Next week is the Valero Texas Open. And then we have the Masters Tournament, which will be the first major championship of the year, as it always is. So before we get to Valero and the Masters, this week we are in Houston for Memorial Park Golf Course. Fellas, I'm out this week on my bet since I'm doing PGA Tour Live. You can catch me on Stream 3, feature groups all week long, and also the 17th hole. But Spencer, you and Nick have picks. Nick, shout out to Peter Malnati. We got the homage with the bucket hat. Spencer, <laughs> you are on the tee first. Who you got with your best bet for the Houston Open this week? Two things, Roberto. First of all, the match play was the best betting tournament of the entire year. Very sad to see that off the schedule. And I think we might be going to one of the worst betting tournaments of the entire year. So nice excuse for why you can't give picks where I think Nick and I are trying to find a player or two that we can even mention on this show. We can talk about why that is. There's a lot of reasons that come into play there. I'm going to go, and if I don't give a matchup, and I think that's kind of the indicator of what I think about a tournament, when I don't give a matchup, then everything has gone south for me with the numbers that I've run. I'm going to give a long shot uh, inside the top 20 market where I'm just going to bet on the upside here. There is a floor that is going to be very low, but Nate Lashley plus 550 to come top 20. That is over at Bet365. I think Lashley's intriguing. Had some... Strong results at similar courses, so excited to hear that cap in a moment. Nick, who you got for your best bet this week? Yeah, like Spencer said, if I could uh, like apply to be security or like a <laughs> volunteer field field marshal, just so I like am legally not allowed to bet, I would definitely take the flight and the loss down to Florida and do so. But uh, if that's not the case, I will take Grayson Sig top forty, where ties paid in full at plus one forty. Okay, Grayson Sig, top 40, plus 140 with ties in full. Before we get into that cap, Spencer, why are you targeting the top 20 market with Nate Lashley? I think it just comes down to the boomer bust potential. Like, it's something that I've talked about quite frequently on this show when I have the positive trajectory in my model for upside, and all of a sudden you look at the safety markets and the players moving in the wrong direction. I think those are the spots that you want to shoot it as far up the board as possible. So, Lashley doesn't work. Like I, I agree with Nick Sig play. It's a better top 40 play to target Sig in that sort of area. I, I think Lashley is the exact opposite of a bet to where it's either he puts the pieces together and he provides one of those top 15 like finishes that we've seen over the past six events, or it's the four missed cuts that have come into play with him. So he was the biggest outlier in my model when trying to look for upside versus safety. Those numbers catapulted him up my board just because of the three top 12 results out of the six main categories that I ran statistically for this tournament. Uh, as I said, it's a boomer bust play to where Lashley has not only missed cut potential, but also bottom of the board potential. But I thought at plus 550 here, it was a really enticing price to swing for the fence on a golfer that does have legitimate. And I think for the price, and we can talk about it in the outright market, legitimate win equity um, for this tournament when you can get them in that like 250 to plus range. So I thought this was just a, an additional way to get exposure to Lashley here, plus 550 for a top 20. A little fun fact about Nate Lashley. In the first playing of this event at Memorial Park Golf Course, this is the fourth one upcoming this, this week. In the first one in 2020, he led the field in strokes gained around the green, gaining almost 1.7 strokes around the green per round, which is a ton. Uh, so he probably missed some greens, but we've seen him, as he said, those high-end finishes at Torrey Pines, another long golf course like this one uh, with not a ton of scoring opportunities. He popped on approach then with the putter as well. Really strong result with TPC Sawgrass being one of the elite approach players that, that week. So 
Exciting to see if he pops this week for you at that big number. Nick, why do you like Grayson Sig this week in Houston? Yeah, overall, he was uh, 32nd in my model overall and then inside the top 30 in model safety. So for me, that's usually going to price it, I guess, in a, in a more loaded field. It'd be right around plus 125. But in this field, watered down, I would have that closer to even money. So he's one of the top scramblers uh, inside the PGA Tour so far this year in 2024. His ball striking has been in fantastic form, especially with the iron play. So again, this is more just... Uh, a price grab for me, I think, when he was here in 2022 and missed a cut by a couple strokes, his game was in very bad form. I know he's not scoring necessarily like crazy right now, but I love what I'm seeing with the irons. I love the watered down field. And again, I will take 30 to 40 points of value in the placement market every single time, even though it's it has not been very fruitful so far this season. Um, but yeah, uh, Grayson Sig, it, it, like Spencer said, I think it's a guy we would bet for safety. I don't think the the upside is is very high, if at all. Um, but inside the top 40 in this field, I do like Grayson Sig here. Yeah, you mentioned the safety. He's a guy who's going to find a bunch of fairways. He's gained strokes on approach in six out of eight tournaments this season, and the ones where he hasn't gained, he's basically been neutral. So seems like a pretty safe play and a guy that should be a solid bet at that number for a top 40 this week. Gentlemen, we've got our best bets out of the way. We'll jump into our course preview right now. Then we'll go through our outright cards Go through the rest of the card, any other bets that you have. We'll talk about one and done where nobody really did anything last week in our group. And then we'll rapid fire through the rest of the golfers on the board at 50 to 1 or shorter. But without further ado, let's get into our course preview for Memorial Park Golf Course in Houston. Spencer, I'll let you take the floor. So over the past few weeks, we've had similar discussions about tournaments that are moving on the set schedule from a different month from when they normally get played. We got some of those answers at the players championship, how that course shifted in expectation between the two starting times. I, I guess when you look here in Houston, there are a few ways that you could highlight the board. You're going to get overseeded dormant Bermuda. That's going to help the landing zones be a little bit softer. I still think strokes gained around the green are going to matter. Anytime you get a Tom Dote course, it's a very unique contextual setup that you get there, but I also think on, on the flip side of that, March more or less gives you that give or take because there's extra wind that's in the forecast there. So it makes it an awkward build. And and I don't think that's necessarily, at least personally, why I didn't like this tournament. There are some statistical, I don't want to say anomalies necessarily, but just, just situations here that we don't necessarily have the answers to with how this tournament is going to play in March. But I think when you look at Memorial Park, it's a long course at 7,400 yards. It's widely regarded as one of the top municipal golf courses in the world. There was a 2019 renovation of the track. Tom Doak remodeled the layout, got it back up and running for the nearly 60,000 patrons who visit the grounds each year. Uh, that's quite the impressive feat. So, you know, I, I think when you look here, he was accompanied on the project by Brooks Kepka. That rebuild aimed to create a challenging tournament venue that could provide dramatic lead changes down the stretch. My opinion, I thought they did that brilliantly. You get six holes yielding somewhere between a 21% or higher bogey or worse rate or 26% birdie or better percentage on the back nine alone. That's going to cause some massive deviations down the stretch for those who like to live bet a tournament. Although it goes back to my initial point for this. And, and I think even with the softer landing conditions, anytime you think of a dope property, it's always this distinctive green complexes that comes into play. So I think it's going to remain front and center. There's been over a 5% increase in dispersion of scoring here in strokes gain around the green versus a typical track. Do you think maybe it drops a little bit, maybe more into that 3% range, which is still a very large increase in strokes gain around the green. If that's what we get for this tournament, you're going to have large specimen Oak trees. That's going to cause some trouble off the tees. If you're wayward, you have, these really unique landing areas and just these diverse sort of holes. Like there's a clamshell hole out on the course to where like, you don't see these things all the time. Um, reduction in GIR percentage. I think you need to hit fairways just because of the narrower than average uh, returns there. At the end of the day though, this is a diabolical course that might be a little bit more simplistic than we've gotten in years past. I think that if we look at this being, you know, 10 under at its easiest, it's probably more 
I mean, Finau won it at 16, Ortiz won it at 13. You're probably somewhere in that 13 to 16 range, but I, I don't necessarily foresee this getting into like the 20 under par or better sort of digits. But I mean, the thing about the PGA Tour this year, and we've noted it quite frequently, they do seem to be making pin locations easier. Scoring's been uh, a lot more simplistic in a lot of these spots. I have heard that the rough has been shaved off in a lot of areas and it's not going to be as thick. So it's kind of a complicated course because we've gotten one thing in the past and now you get a tournament change to a different month and you probably get ease based off of that answer and then what they're also doing with the course. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head by giving the overall course layout. I'll emphasize that Brooks Kepka was the PGA Tour player who gave input on the redesign here and he wanted a course that could deliver a challenge like a major championship while also being amenable for your everyday golfer as they get 60,000 rounds on this golf course every year. So they widened the fairways in 2019. So they have relatively wide fairways. You mentioned the rough being shaved in November. Previously, they had two and a half inch Bermuda grass rough. Now it's one and a quarter inch ryegrass. So a little bit different uh, texture, not going to be as tough out of the ryegrass as it is unpredictable out of Bermuda. You'll also have, as you mentioned, the undulating greens. It'll be interesting to see the pin placements because they have the big greens where normally for everyday play, they put the pins in less challenging locations, but they do have some options given the greens to make it a lot tougher. So that'll be fun. Uh, if the winds are down, could see some pretty diabol diabolical pins potentially. And Spencer, from a distribution of approach shots, what did you make of this week? I know in past weeks in Florida, we had a few weeks where over 150 yards, for example, was emphasized. Anything on that front that you weighed or just more of a holistic approach uh, this week in your model? I mean, I just weighed it across the board of what it is. Like your one range where you're going to get the massive increase is going to be from 200 plus. There's about a 3% increase in expected shots from that distance. Uh, not anything though inside of my model that was vastly different. Like I just kept it with the simplistic output of what we've gotten in expected returns over the first three years. And I recalculated the weights based off of that. But uh, most of the holes get a very slight decrease and then you get the increase at the very back end there from a longer distance. That makes a ton of sense. Also wanted to add that there are five par threes, three par fives, and it is a par 70 this week. So with all that in mind, Nick, I want to give you a chance. Anything else you'd like to mention about the course before we hop into our outright card? No, um, I'm interested to see how it plays. Like Spencer said, you hear a lot of rumors every source you go to. But yeah, statistically, it's been a hard course to hit fairways, a harder course to hit greens and regulations. So the scrambling is something that I value still. But like Spencer said, the, the unknown will be pretty interesting. So excited to see that. And Roberta, have you played here before? I have not. No? Okay. I, I need to. Yeah. All right. Let's get out there one of these days. It looks absolutely beautiful. So I'm excited to see it again on TV. Fellas, let's jump into our outright cards. Nick, I'll swing it back to you. Do you have anybody on the card this week or should we swing it over to Spencer? I'm in between three guys. As of now, I have one unit at risk. Those are both on um, placement wagers. It's like, I don't even want to entertain this without Scotty Shuffler market. I'm not going to bite for that. So the, the three that I have right now that I'm interested in, I don't really have value on the number on Sahith Gala, but I really do like this setup for him, especially if that rough being rye is going to be a lot easier to hit out of. I love his scrambling. The putter can get hot. Can certainly make this a very, very short course with the bomb and gouge type of style that we see from Tigala. Then it was Jason Day. I don't want to get Spencer too excited, but I just, I don't know, 25 to one for how well he's playing, especially with the off to tee game. I'm, I'm kind of into that. And then a long shot, I like Joseph Bramlett. But I have not punched a ticket anywhere because I'm, I'm worried about Scotty as the rest of the field is. Looking at Joseph Bramlett on our sponsor, Bet365. He's available out there at 120 to one. Nick is wearing the bucket hat in homage to Peter Malnati, who cast it 350 to one, uh, making That's everybody sweet. like us who bets on this weekly look like fools last week. Cause I don't think I've heard anybody give out a Peter Malnati pick in years. Uh, Especially when we have Cameron Young right behind him. Oh, my God, what kind of, what kind of year of second places has it been? Unbelievable. 
I uh, I did put one measly dollar on Chandler Phillips at 350 to one as well. Uh, that was a fun one dollar bet for around 70 holes. Dude, that was honestly, I was I was listening back to the show. I was like, that was really the only like piece of advice that came to fruition was Chandler Phillips' name being mentioned. What did you have, top 40 on him? Top 40 at plus 300. I actually found it nice. at plus 325, but we gave it out Great at plus ticket. 300. Great ticket. Nice job. I liked, I liked yeah, our no, strategy no last week. For me. I liked our strategy with the best bets last week. I think we all took similar routes. Mine was just the one that hit, but you got to trust the process, and if you do it enough, it works out. So... Speaking of that, Spencer, I know you do have an outright card. Who do you have on it, and why are we backing these guys? Well, my best bet last week played like 18 holes, and then he pulled out of the tournament. So I didn't – you got 70 <laughs> holes out of this where you got excitement. My guy was just out of the tournament like within half of the – before even Friday took place. But I think when you look at this board, and it's kind of what Nick was talking about, and it stretches even a little bit further than that. Here's the problem. When you have markets with Scheffler as a bettable commodity and he's three to one, it's not even the problem. And, and there, there is win equity, or at least perceived win equity that gets removed from the equation when Scheffler is in the field. And I think at the three to one price that any ticket that you punch at least runs the risk that things can go south and Scheffler wins this. And I don't necessarily mind. It's hard to win a golf tournament. I don't mind attacking against Scotty Scheffler if books would have given us an ability to do so. The problem is they put Scheffler at three to one and then you have that range. And I agree. I think if there was like a second name for me, it's probably the I think Finau makes some sense, but like Wyndham Clark, the Gala, Zalatoris, Finau, you have all these guys that got priced as if Scotty Scheffler is not even in the field at three to one. There's such a massive hold percentage across the board that any yes, market sir. that has Scheffler in it, I worry about Scheffler and you're not getting the enhanced price that you need in that spot. And then I've seen it a very popular narrative in the space that find the markets without Scotty Scheffler and bet it that way. The books have gone so rogue in the pricing there that like these returns that we're looking at on a player like Wyndham Clark and some of these names, it's like there's no value to be found in those spots. So my model really conducted this idea that re the only way you were going to find value on this board is if you went down to the very bottom and took long shots. And Maybe part of that for me ends up being to where I I'm okay taking these few long shots. And if Scotty wins, that's fine. And, you know, even if a name like the Gala wins, I, I will stomach it and be okay. Just because I don't think that there's value on the number where it is. I wish he was 30 to one. We could have a different conversation based off of that answer. But um, if nothing else, and I think people that listen to the show all the time will know this, I am very resilient. I am taking Steven Yeager. Once again, I grabbed them at 50 to one. My model just continues to love his ball striking acumen when you get some of these courses that heighten his putting return. Given that answers quite a few times on this show. And, you know, Jaeger seems to regress to a putter that loses five strokes in those situations when I do grab him. So there's always the risk that the putting goes south. But 71st in my model and expected putting on any course in the world that he plays. He's 37th here on corollary green types. I've just always been higher than the market on Jaeger. I thought this was probably the one you know, if you want to call him high end sort of name in this field, at least in this like sub 50 to one range that actually saw a heightened price because of this lack of public intrigue that is put around him. I grabbed Doug Gim at 80 to one. Nice bounce back spot for Gim, in my opinion. I don't know what the upside actually is. He was 67th last week at the Valspar. People were on him in that event. Now they quickly seem to be moving in the other direction in some ways. There's still some sharp money that I think have hit this, but he had generated five top 16 finishes before last week's slip up. I just thought that when he opened at 80 to one, there was too much value in that number there. Grabbed Andrew Novak at 175 to one. And this is really for me where I just started peppering these long shots over and over again of players that I thought we didn't get the correction for. So with Novak, three top 10 finishes, four top 17 results over the past five weeks. Books are typically extremely quick to shrink these tolls when anyone shows any form of life, but... I think we didn't get that here just with how aggressive the market is on the favorites. So I thought Novak slipped further down the board than he should have. Fifth in my model for expected tee to green performance. And he also saw similar Jaeger-like projections with the putter, where he jumped from 116th over his past 24 rounds to 53rd on corollary overseeded Bermuda tracks. I've always been a believer. It's something I've talked about quite a bit on these shows. If you give me a ball-striking golfer, 
and they all of a sudden are able to add those quality putting returns, that's when they win the golf tournament. That's when we get these outlier wins that come into play at these 175 or plus numbers. I took Max Grazerman 250 to one. I don't know how much we should trust his par five scoring. Uh, my model had him six in the sheet for par five birdie or better percentage when I did allow those numbers to show without regression, but a uh, safe player for me in my model. I don't really ever anticipate names like this that are 250 to one to crack the top 25 for me. So the fact that Grazerman did for both from an overall rank and an upside perspective, I thought it was just too deep of a price there at 250 to one. I think the boomer bust candidate of the week is Nate Lashley at 250 to one. I talked about him of why I liked him to be all the same reasons there. I think it's a high ceiling for a player who has extremely low floor. And then I don't know, maybe this is one of those situations where I just go back to the well. And I mean, this was, this was a Nick and I failure last week. And I don't even know if he necessarily played that poorly. If you take away the Thursday round, but Jacob Bridgman, 300 to one found the water on the seventh hole on Thursday. Um, it was rather steady. Other than that, if you take away that hole on the par five, that completely took him out of the event, but I never necessarily want to look into one round too much. He was fine on Friday. Didn't necessarily break my model in a way where, you know, he was slightly negative off the tee and approach. But I also think that's a tough spot for a golfer that you probably have taken yourself out of an ability to make a cut. So it's kind of difficult to go back out there on Friday. I don't know what the upside is here either, but I think at 300 to one, there are some off the tee problems that I could certainly note within my model for why this will not find success. But at 300 to one, you're always going to have those red flag moments and situations that come into play. So uh, for me, I mean, outside of Jaeger, and I wasn't even planning to go that Jaeger route until he drifted to 50, it, it is pretty much triple digit bets over and over again. And I just found the top of the board, even if we remove Scotty, like even if Scotty's not the one that ends up crushing and, and winning this tournament, I, I just think that there's too low of prices on the Finals, Clarks, the Gala, Zalatoris. I think you're kind of just throwing a dart at a board and I don't want to be throwing darts at boards when golfers are between 12 and 22 to one. The exposure adds up too quickly. I'm not in the game to say that I've hit 16 outright winners in 2024. I want to turn a profit. And uh, I mean, that's probably one of your winners if we're being honest here, but it's just too much exposure for me to really get up to the board there. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree. I think I was surprised on Monday morning running our odds post to see so many guys at 25 to one or shorter in addition to Scotty Scheffler. Um, but I agree. I think that Sahit Digala and Wyndham Clark right behind Scheffler makes the most sense. If you had to take a Wyndham Clark, Thigala and Scheffler versus the field, would you guys take that? Nick? What would the price be? Even money. Uh, no. It's still golf, and no, and just, no, not doing it. I, I would also take the field in that spot. I think there's just enough volatility at the end of the day, but um, th those are the favorites for a reason, and mm -hmm. I'm not necessarily trying to, like, dissuade people off of them other than any reason than this being just a, a reverse number grab situation to where I, I just don't have value on the price of what they've released it. Like, we see this quite frequently from sports books. When there are inconsistencies in the answer, so there's a there's a move change from November to March. There's this Scotty Scheffler dilemma of what is going to happen with him. Books take a very cautious approach in those positions because they don't mm -hmm. also want to end up with too much exposure on a tournament that I think they have question marks for. And any times that any time that a book ends up taking that position my model really has a hard time finding value because they're kind of masking and shading all the exposure away from any of the spots that you would want to be. That makes a ton of sense. Spencer, I like the Steven Yeager play. I thought he was one of the few players who I thought could have been in that 30, 35 range. Yeah. Uh, very, very fair price. Absolutely. And pod play for me, by the way. Nice. And I think I'm going to, I'm going to follow on Graceman. I've been a big fan of him, like him and Bridgman. I look at him every single week. So I think two fifty to one for the, the upside is, has there been anything said about Scotty's neck rehabbing anything like that? I know Sunday he looked fine. I'm assuming all is well. Um, is there any concerns there? I haven't really looked into him obviously because the contrarian side of me just has no interest in paying the inflated price obviously. And then 
DFS side of things. He's like 13 K. I think we hit a record. <laughs> I have not heard anything, but I'll do a quick Google search. If we find anything. He has no, I'm assuming no news is good news, but I don't know. I figured they would talk about it. I would think that today would be when we might hear something Tuesday afternoon when we're recording this of Houston open week. So Keep an eye on that uh, as this progresses. When you listen to this Wednesday morning, most likely uh, there might be some more news. So just do a quick search on Scotty Scheffler. Maybe something's come up. Um, gentlemen, we have touched on our outright cards, best bets. Wanted to talk about one and done before we get into the rest of the card. I'll start it off. Uh, Steven Yeager was somebody I considered. Right now, I have Luke List as my guy. I thought that there was a lot of commonalities between this course, Mexico Open, uh, Torrey Pines. Uh, I don't think the putting surfaces are as similar and the short game, but Augusta National, I think because of some wide failure ways, some uh, longer approaches, I think that could those could all be some similar comp courses and players who've done well at those, Steven Yeager, Jake Knapp, um, Luke List in the past, winner at Torrey Pines as well. I think those guys all make sense. Those are kind of my three guys that I'm looking at this week. I don't want to go with a big dog because there's just not that much money in the pool this week. So I'm really between those three guys. But right now I have Luke List because I like the putter. Although Jake Knapp is intriguing. But I know, Nick, you mentioned you're intrigued by Jake Knapp too. I don't want to be different than you, though. Yeah, that's fair. I think as of now, my three options are Jason Day, Jake Knapp or Tigawa. I think Tigawa is going to be so damn popular, though. I guess in our small league, that's fine. But in large contests, I may go a different direction. But right now, I think, again, I said Cameron Young last week, which worked out fantastic. But I guess I did not change him in our own contest. So you're welcome there. But yeah, it's Jason, because of it's because of me. The head faking. I... <laughs> yeah, well, I I talk to you out of him, and I and I do this every single weekend. And when push, yeah, leave me push, alone. Well, I'm trying to. But here's <laughs> the problem, and, and I think this is like a mistake that people make in one and done contests in general. And we have a smaller group of of players in this, but I think there's even some sentiment that comes into play. People worry about not coming in last place at the end of the day with it, and like really, if you're not winning, I don't care what my result ends up being, and. I think there's aggression that has to take place. And my biggest concern, and I've already put myself in a hole, I used Scotty at the very first tournament of the year. I wish I could have had him at the API. I had Wyndham Clark as my alternate, essentially, in this contest. I used him as my pick in a different one and done when he won at Pebble Beach. Kind of just made the wrong decision every single time that I push has come to shove for me in these spots. But I don't know. Like I was so afraid because Nick has pulled this card on me countless times this year where he tells me he's not going to play a golfer and I, being as far back as I am, I can't play Cameron young and I'm already millions of dollars down and share, you know, what is essentially a million dollars. They're like, I feel like when I'm this far down, any pick that I make, I have to hit solo because there's a lot of room that needs to get made up here. It's hard enough to hit one golf tournament. I don't want to share it with two, three, four other people when it happens. So I, I, Really what I did is I ruined Nick. So, I mean, if yeah. Nick, if you want to put that on the tab of, I'm sure everything that I owe you at this point, ruined you in this contest. And in the process, by thinking that you were still going to take Cameron Young, after saying I was going to take Cameron Young, went with Aaron Rice. So uh, I got $0 oh. there in the other contest that I'm in. I took Cameron Young. It's just everything that I can do wrong in this group. I have... Um, I'm probably going to take Steven Yeager right now. I'm assuming I still have him left. Although for me, I probably have used them somewhere, but um, I, I, I don't know. I'm in a bad I know spot Nick, right now. I know Nick used Jaeger at the um, Mexico Open. Mexico, so. yep, yep. He's gone for me, so that is not an option. So we both have him. Um, I'm intrigued by the I, Yeah. I was just going to say, if you're a front runner in this sort of a situation, I, I, I think the Gala does make a lot of sense. Like I, I, That's something that you should be – aware of he's going to be popular, but game theory also changes on what the correct answer is based off of where you are in the standings. I don't think the Gala does me a ton of good. And like, even if you two don't take him, I assume out of the 12 other people, he's going to be picked three or four times. So um, I'm sure Zalatoris can enter that mix too for other names that are going to get thrown out there. But 
I'm going to have to just kind of zig when other people zag and I'm either going to make up the ground by doing that, or I'm probably going to come in last. But right now it's the trajectory I'm on is make every wrong decision and come in last. If you're not somebody who has live golfers available in your major championships, I think the gal is a sneaky play for the masters. You could be a little contrarian I there. Do. I yep. have, I'm not the first person to compare the century to the masters in that similar players have popped up both, which is why I use the gala at the century. So he's got like half of my money earned so far this season off of that tie for second and one and done. So I don't have him available, but I think there are spots where you could use him later in the year, depending on your strategy and where you are in your pool uh, to, to strongly consider. Uh, Cause I I'm very bullish on the gala overall this season. Um, gentlemen, I know we've gone through our best bets, outrights, course preview, now one and done. Spencer, I know you have some other bets on the card. Nick, you do too. Spencer, I'll let you go first. Who else do you have on the card besides your outrights and your Nate Lashley top 20 bet? It's just a low exposure tournament for me. Like like all these bets, Lashley 0.3 units to win 1.65. Took Max Grazerman at 5 to 1 for a top 20, 0.2 units to win 1. And then the only other play that I have, and I don't necessarily love it as much as I did earlier in the day, just because I, I do think we get easier scoring here. I think that there's an ability for players to potentially use their driver and distance off the tee. It's kind of the answer that you gave for Luke List. Like my model was a little bit lower on Luke List. It's kind of an every week answer, but I do think he can find success here. And Cameron Champ, I bet him to miss the cut at plus 110. I worry a little bit that the course conditions might be soft enough that his par five scoring and distance ends up getting him into the weekend. Um, but I mean, if this plays like it has, and I don't even want to say in years past, cause I don't think it's going to quite, but if that around the green test from Doak still stands, I don't trust Cameron champ in a situation with his iron proximity or with the around the green game. So I still think there's a little bit of value at plus 110. I, I, if this was a tournament played in November in years past, I probably would have bet this for a full unit. I only put a half unit on it for that reason. And I think there's even an argument to be made that that could have been slightly aggressive at the end of the day with some of these new numbers that I've added and the way that champ has climbed for me, but still a projected miscut candidate. And if I can get him at plus 110, it was a number grab there. But uh, like in total for me, my card is at less than two units through everything that I've talked about. So uh, we'll see if there's anything in tournament wise that I can find value on, but uh, not a ton that I saw pre event for a, a lot of those reasons that I keep harping on over and over again. Cam champ, a couple notes on him played this event just one time. And the last time it was played in 2022, November missed the cut, uh, lost 3.31 strokes around the green in that tournament, which I'm going to guess had to be the worst in the field. Let's take a quick peek. Um, so among players who mid, who missed the cut, that was by far, well, that was second worst. Garrett Higo was the worst, but nobody else was even in within a mile of them. So that around the green uh, cap, I think is dead on. Also he's played in eight events this year, nine of, or seven of which have data missed cuts in six of eight has lost strokes on approach every single tournament so far this season. And the only two tournaments where he made the cut at the Mexico open and last week at the Valspar aided by a putter that gained over a stroke per round on the greens. So really it's, is he going to flash with the putter and can he take advantage of the driver? And otherwise he's still rough on approach. And when he misses on approach, he's going to have to deal with his poor short game. So I like that one. Unfortunately, I can't tail any bets this week. Uh, Nick, what else do you have in the placement market sector? Surprisingly, I found value in uh, Thigala at Ooh. plus 225. I had this proper right around plus 190, 195. Obviously, has back-to-back -to -back top 10s, four top 10s already on the year, and all four of those were in absolutely loaded fields. Um, so, again, with the, uh, the changes in the rough, uh, I think this – just missing the fairway would be a lot less penal than it has been in years past. So that's obviously like our only concern with the hiss because uh, otherwise great scrambler uh, putter has been relatively good so far this year. And the Bermuda putting has not been terrible in comparison to the baseline. So I will go with the gala plus 225 for a top 10. All right. I like that play. I think that makes a ton of sense. 
Uh, was that ties in full or just top 10 uh, normal? Just top 10, yeah. Ties in oh. full, I think I can get down to plus 140, but I'm not taking... I am seeing... 80 points off the off the ticket there, I guess. Maybe 180 out there, potentially, on 365. Do they they I'm do seeing have the other option. Yeah. With ties in full at Bet365, our sponsor. And that is the perfect time to give a reminder that this podcast is presented by North Carolina's newest sports book, Bet365. Bet365 doesn't do ordinary. That's why you get more boosts with them than with anyone else. Every day, they power up the odds on hundreds of bets to give you a chance to win more. Bet365 boosts specific markets, your winnings, and even parlays, and they don't stop there. Keep an eye out for their biggest and best odds with the incredible Super Boost. Check out the boost and see why it's never ordinary at Bet365. Must be 21 or older and present in Arizona, Colorado, Indiana, Iowa, Louisiana, North Carolina, New Jersey, Ohio, Virginia, or 18 and older in Kentucky. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or 1-800-BETS-OFF in Iowa. Terms, conditions, and restrictions apply. Quick aside, I know we had the Jonte Porter uh, revelations yesterday in the NBA. If there was ever a sport where we could pay off a guy, it would be golf because it's an individual game. You know they're going to get to play. Uh, there's no playing time, of course, if anybody does it, uh, where you bet your unders. or In golf, it would be, I guess, the over on your total score. The handle would give it away immediately, uh, so you'd have to be pretty slick with it. But that just got me got me thinking uh, for another day, perhaps. Well, uh, um, apparently, money does talk in golf with everybody who's leaving towards lives. So, I, I don't know, Roberto, if this is the route that we want to go down with this show here. But, uh, <laughs> I, yeah, I want to say we should look into Justin Lauer, maybe one of his siblings or best friends as a bookmaker that happened to take Spencer and I's action <laughs> on his placement market and. Uh, you know, uh, he didn't have flu-like symptoms like Porter, but uh, he just leaves the tournament after Snappy Club and uh, tells us to pound sand. So thanks for that, Justin. All right, we bounce back. Uh, gentlemen, we have um, the rapid fire segment, unless you guys have any other bets that you'd like to work through here um, that you're considering. No, right. probably not. I, I think I think your answer for Luke List and just my models overall inability to cap him correctly, I guess. Like List has definitely been a weak spot for me. I considered fading him in a matchup. I've decided not to go down that route. I think you brought up a lot of good points, and um this is probably in theory a pretty good course fit for his length. I do think the around the green game for him gives a lot of reason for pause. And one thing that a Tory Pines gives him is just less short grass. And so there's more short grass here to deal with, especially uh, with more of the Poe available. That's the one hang up for me on him, but he's a 90 to one golfer for a reason. So um, I think he has upside, but at the same time, the floor is not very high. So we'll see what happens there, but the putter isn't a complete liability. So I do think that's why I think there's some upside. Yeah, um, and I might be running things from a little bit too long of a perspective to begin with, with list that's not allowing. Like, I know the putter has still been boom or bust recently, but mm -hmm. at least he's had ability to spike. And, and I guess for me, like when I was looking specifically for a matchup that I'd never got to, it was like Taylor Montgomery over Luke List. And I don't know if I can sit there for two days or four days or whatever it becomes and watch Taylor Montgomery hit approach shots like it might drive me nuts <laughs> specifically to point. specifically to if i don't think the around the green impact is quite as impactful because then all of a sudden taylor montgomery loses some of his short game upside and if list is hitting a higher percentage of greens in regulation just because now we have a softer course in general and he doesn't have to worry about the around the green game as much there are ways that that bet went south. So I just decided to stay off of it. I, I didn't necessarily want to get trapped specifically. Like the last thing you ever want to do in sports betting is chase after like last week was a unmitigated disaster for the most part with my card, like nothing went right. And even if you look on Sunday to where I had multiple plays and I wrote about it in an article and I was like, well, I like Chandler Phillips against champ. And I like Carl Yuan in his matchup against uh, Lee Hodges, but 
there's too much there's too much wind in the forecast for me to necessarily feel comfortable for a tournament where I've already lost five units. Like, let's just call it. And I don't want this to be the week where we chase back on it. So it's been a good season so far on the matchups. It's been a good season pretty much all the way around other than the placement market. That's the only thing that's in the red for me so far this year. But uh, I just don't think this is the tournament to chase. Like there's going to be events that are better than others. And the tournaments that don't have necessarily that positive return inside of my model, I don't think we need to go broke betting those events. Yeah, always bet on your edge, not based on your recent results, trying to get back to even or get back to a certain profit. Just discipline is a big part of the game. And that's where I think a lot of sports books end up getting people because of chasing. So always bet responsibly. Um, and we're going to try to do our best to give you an edge whenever we can find it, of course. One one really quick note before we move on and we'll move on past this. I, I really believe that the reason why sports books make money beyond the, the little edge that they have to begin with, but like where they actually make as much money as they do is the lack of bankroll management that people bring to the table. Mm -hmm. uh, parlays don't help the average better. I, I think if like your random person that makes a straight bet, and even if you need to hit it like 52 and a half plus percent of the time to turn a profit on it, most people, most people out there are not going to be on the high end or the massive low end of that equation. Most people land somewhere in that like 46 to 52 percent range and it doesn't necessarily put a massive dent the big problem comes into play is when people start chasing with money that they don't have and then all of a sudden the bank roll dwindles away in a fashion to where if you just stayed the course and ended up finding your edges you would be able to get back into the game but i think that's really where the sports books make most of their money is just people chasing totally agreed and one thing i like about our podcast we don't give a lot of bets with juice not a lot of one minus 120 minus 150s on our bets. I know this week you could go that route, but you guys have been disciplined going for the top 20, top 40s at plus crooked numbers. So uh, hopefully they pay off, but if not, it's not a big loss and we can move on to next week's board where hopefully we get a little bit less hold percentage uh, and more opportunities in San Antonio. But fellas, let's move into the rapid fire quickly. We have, uh, we mentioned a few of the players at the top of the board, so I'll keep moving along. Uh, Wyndham Clark is 13 to one. Would you rather have a ticket on him to win the tournament? We discussed, um, we discussed Sahith, so I'll move past him. Would you rather have a Wyndham Clark 13 to one ticket, a Willie Z 22 to one ticket, or a Jason Day at 24 to one? Spencer, I'll start with you. Based off of where the price would be for those answers, I don't want to pay that number for Wyndham Clark, so I would remove him. I do think he's the most likely person to win, so we could argue about what the correct number actually is on him. I would say that that's not the right number, though. I think it's very close between Day and Zalatoris was the other one, correct? Yes. It almost feels... I mean, this this is... I'm going to say Zalatoris for one reason. I can't have the public breakup with Jason Day for Wyndham Clark, and then you put them in a category with each other, <laughs> and I take Jason Day over Wyndham Clark. I think it's very close. I'll say Zalatoris is ball striking, and this is under the mindset that this maybe plays a little bit closer to 12 under par than it would 16 under par. I think if we get up to 16 under, Zalatoris loses some of his win equity there, but I'll say Zalatoris for the sake of the show. I also wanted to point out that Jason Day – who has historically been your favorite golfer, now Wyndham Clark because of recent top-of-the-leaderboard finishes. Wyndham Clark's data golf profile, where you look at the strokes gained um, for the strokes gained spire chart with driving distance, driving accuracy, approach play, around the green play, putting, looks almost identical to peak Jason Day in 2015, where they're on the inside of the spider web on the driving accuracy and at almost the corners of the spider web on everything else. Uh, guys who have the putting in the short game to capitalize on their increased approach play. And that's been a recipe for success. So I think it's pretty interesting that your two favorite players statistically are pretty similar. Uh, nobody can say that I don't have a type then, I guess. <laughs> Nick, among those three, Wyndham Clark, Willie Z, and Jason Day, which one would you most rather have a ticket on? At those Wyndham Clark. Honorable mention, Jason Day. I think I'm out on Wilsey. Yeah. 
let's move along to last season's champion here. Tony Finau is 27 to 1. Si Wu Kim is 32 to 1. Alex Noren, a name I didn't think I would see under 50 to 1 this week, he's 37 to 1. And Keith Mitchell is also 37 to 1. Had a pretty nice 54 holes last week before struggling on the final round. Among Big Tone, Si Wu, Alex Noren, and Killa Keith. Spencer, which one would you most rather have a ticket on? So, so for me, like, even if you took the players in the first question and you added these golfers, this is more of where I would ideally like to be to begin with. I think Fina was intriguing. I thought Si Wu had some intrigue. I didn't love the number on Si Wu. I wish he would have been 50 to 1 also, kind of like the Alex mm-hmm. Noren discussion. But I'll go with Tony Fina here. Uh, there's a reason why he's found success and won this tournament. And at some point, the putter just has to turn around. And I think the ball striking, while it's for the most part, I mean, you could make an argument, I guess, that the Valspar was just a weird tournament for everybody at the end of the day there. But I still think Finau's in good form with the ball striking returns. Nick? Can I continue to say Tony Finau? <laughs> yeah, I mean, at some point, I think you and I have to be cut off. I just, I believe. Give me Tony Finau. I think it's a nice, I think this is a nice spot for him. This is a, an intriguing number where uh, there is an argument to be made that he potentially was one of the names that drifted also. If you would have looked at this, I mean, take this a year ago, like even before, after he won the tournament, he's a, I mean, I'd be curious to see what his number was when he won here. But like, I feel like in this field, he's an 18, 16 to one golfer. If we had the version of him that we had like a season ago. So I think in in theory, you're getting a number that's a little heightened here on Finau just because of the lack of putting returns. I agree. If I had to pick one of those guys, I would also go Finau. Fellas, we'll wrap it up here. We've already mentioned Jaeger at 50 to 1, so we'll pass him. Tom Hoagie's 55 to 1. Mackenzie Hughes is 55 to 1. So is Bo Hostler, Kirk Kitayama, and Jake Knapp is 60 to 1. Among those guys, Spencer, which one would you most rather have a ticket on? I like Hoagie's proximity numbers always. Um, it's probably him or Jake Knapp at the end of the day. I, I think there's a lot to like about Knapp. I, I worry a little bit about certain factors of what we've gotten recently. I know that if you look, I mean, one of the results, he made a 12 because he found the water a million times. So I don't want to look too much into that. But um, I'll go a little bit against my model, I guess. I'll say Tom Hoagie over Jake Knapp. Nick? I'm going to go Kurt Kitayama. I like Kitayama. He's, he could be a sneaky play this week. Approach play has been really solid this year around the Great between kind of boomer bust, but we know it can do it at these difficult tracks and API has a lot more water than this golf course, but I think there are some similar traits that provide success at both these golf courses being long kind of ball strikers uh, tracks. No doubt. All right, gentlemen, thanks for joining me on the show today. Excited for this week. Uh, Once again, you can catch me on PGA Tour Live. I'm excited to be with Graham Dillette this week on Stream 3. That's our featured groups. So among guys in those featured groups, Jake Knapp, Tom Hoagie, Mackenzie Hughes, uh, plenty of other guys. So very excited. Hope you tune in on ESPN+. Plus, Gentlemen, where can we find your work until we meet again next week for the Valero Texas Open betting preview? I'll start with you, Nick. At Better Golf Pod on Twitter and at Sticks Picks, S T I X P I C K S on Twitter, and probably do another DFS write up at Stochastic. Awesome. Looking forward to checking that out. Fortunately, I can't do DFS this week either, but. That's been a lot of fun uh, listening to you guys and getting more experience in that uh, field. Spencer, where can we find your work this week? You can find me on Twitter at Tee Off Sports. I will have my Wednesday article here for Action Network. I will have two in-tournament bets on Saturday for sure and on one of Thursday or Friday. And you can get my model over at Rotoballer if you like any of the stats that you heard here today. Awesome. So once again, you can find Nick on Twitter at Sticks Picks. That's Sticks with an X. You can find Spencer on Twitter at T Off Sports. And you can find me on Twitter at RobertoA213. Thanks again for tuning in to this week's 
Texas Children's Houston Open bed and preview. And we hope you hit the green this week in the Lone Star State.